Hello and welcome to the special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, Aoife Leader joins Stuart Childs to give tips on best practice management of hedgerows. Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar. Today I have a good topic um, in relation to, I suppose, overall farmyard management rather than dairy specifically. And I'm delighted to be joined by Aoife Leader. So Aoife is a master's student who's beginning to progress into a PhD based in the Kilkenny office under the supervision of Richard O'Brien, who's the Glambia Monitor Farm Programme Coordinator. Uh, and Aoife's focus has been in relation to biodiversity. And today she's going to talk to us in particular about hedgerow management, because as you'll all know, um, next week on the first, Wednesday the first is the start of the hedge cutting season. And obviously there's been an increased focus in relation to the biodiversity that's included in hedgerows and how we manage those is going to be very important in terms of how we manage that biodiversity and cultivate it, I suppose, and promote it. So Aoife is going to give us a presentation and as always, we can uh, put in questions through the Q&A as we go and I'll pop a few questions to you too, Aoife, as we go along. Perfect. But, uh, thanks for coming on. No problem. I'll just share my screen there. Okay, so good morning to everyone tuning in. And as Stuart said, I suppose my name is Aoife Leader and I'm a Chagas UCD Walsh Scholar. And for the past two years, I've been carrying out my studies on the communication of biodiversity management with dairy farmers. And so far those, in those studies, I've been working with um, 11 future farmers um, involved in the signpost future farm with Chagas and Columbia. And as we move through the slides today, I'll have some examples from those farms and how they're managing their hedges. But I suppose the main focus of today will be the management of hedgerows. And I suppose most of us might be more used to looking over the hedges, but this morning we'll, we'll be having a look at what you might find inside the hedges, the value of those hedges, and most importantly, how to best manage them. So it's a great time to start discussing this topic with the hedge cutting season set to open on the 1st of September. So from the first, from next Wednesday until the last day of February of next year, farmers and landowners will be permitted to cut their, their hedges and their trees. So to start off, I just want to give a kind of a brief background on hedges. So what I'm talking about when I'm talking about hedges are those linear landscape features that make up of, made up of a variety of trees and plants. They're found on most farms in Ireland. And because they've been planted, they're categorized as silly natural habitats. So they're man-made habitats. And they need our management if we want to keep them as hedges. So the Irish countryside is defined by the hedgerows. The picture I have here is kind of a common site you see across many parts of the country. Um, a study published by Stuart Green and his colleagues um, indicate that there's 689,000 kilometres of non-stone boundaries in Ireland. So that would include hedgerows and grassy banks. And then a recent study by Julie Larkin and other researchers in Chagas found that 3% of the total area of farms um, involved in their study would be made up by hedgerows. And even in my own studies with the 11 signpost future farms, I found that there was on average 10 kilometers of hedgerow across the group. Um, and those were on average contributing to 3% of their farming platforms. So with hedges being such a common feature on the farm, um, their management is really important to get right. So I suppose the approach to take when it comes to the management of habitats on the farm, it should be carefully thought out and that's true of the hedgerows as well. So farmers who should always start by retaining and maintaining what's already on site because they are of the highest value for biodiversity. So in the case of the hedgerows, this means retaining hedgerows, not digging them up and, and holding on to what we have already. And then we need to maintain the hedges that we have according to best, ma best management practices and choosing the practices that best suit the hedge you have. Only after that then do we start thinking about what more we can do. So after we've retained and maintained, start thinking about enhancing hedgerows. So that might involve rejuvenation by laying or coppicing. And then we move on to thinking about establishing new hedgerows and creating new hedges. And when we're doing that, we always need to use native species of Irish provenance. But the subject of today's webinar it's all about maintaining our existing habitats and if i suppose it's important to point out that like as you said there, there's a huge amount of them on a lot of farms already and that where we are looking to increase biodiversity levels on farms good management of the hedgerows can 
contribute nearly more than actually planting new hedgerows could. Exactly, yeah. The biodiversity value of an, an, an old established hedgerow is will far outweigh a new hedge that you plant. It'll take it years and years to catch up with, with what you already have on farm. And I suppose we talk about quantity and quality of hedgerows. So the quality is really important and we get that when we manage them with best practice. Um, okay. So I suppose why we should care about how we manage our hedgerows, like, you know, there's a, there's a few reasons and they apply to all habitats that you might find on a farm, like the law and regulations oblige farmers to manage their hedges. So on, under the Wildlife Act, you can't cut your hedges when birds are nesting. So that's why we only cut them between September and February. And that's the case under cost compliance as well. There's laws around um, the retention of hedgerows and replacing hedgerows. And then farmers who avail of derogation will be familiar that they're obliged to carry out one or a combination of hedgerow management practices. Um, there's a financial aspect to it. So in the past schemes like reps and glass, farmers would have received payment for, for managing their hedgerows in that. And recent times we've had the rollout of the results-based environment agri-pilot, the REAP program, and farmers and that are being financially rewarded for managing their hedges to a good standard and then in future we expect like that there'll be results-based payment schemes to come down uh, and that they will become commonplace um, and we'll have eco schemes as well but management of hedgerows it also plays a, a really crucial role in maintaining our green image and it's really important for the marketing of our dairy products um, at home and abroad and of course maintaining hedgerows and other biodiversity features, it's always associated with a sense of well-being and stewardship. So farmers being custodians of the countryside and having the habitats and hedgerows and spaces for nature on farm. It's nice to have, and it also sets up the farm for future generations. So hedgerows are also really valuable biodiversity features. And when I'm talking about biodiversity, I mean the native wildlife and plants and the habitats that they live in. And one of those, of course, is the hedgerow. So hedgerows themselves are usually made up of a variety of plants and tree species. In most hedges, you'll find the thorn trees or the shkiaks, which are the white thorn and the black thorn, and they are a staple of the hedge, hedgerow species. Um, as well as that, then you have a variety of other plants, holly, dog rose, spindle, gilder rose, and these all tolerate cutting. Some hedges might have smooth stem species like oak and ash as well. They don't cope as well with cutting, but they're usually left to grow up into mature trees. So the hedge itself is a habitat for native plants to grow in, which then in turn provides an abundance of benefits for wildlife. So there's a whole host of animal species that rely on hedges as a source of food and shelter. A really important aspect of the hedge is the benefits that they provide for our pollinators, um, such as butterflies, hoverflies, and 99 different species of bees that we have. So it's important that hedges are well maintained in order to support them in their role as pollinators. Um, and we do that by ensuring that the hedge provides food when they need it in the form of pollen and nectar, which they get from the flowering plants and trees. And that's a key point to remember when you're talking about managing hedges. And then wherever we have a fruit, sorry, wherever we have a flower, we have a fruit um, and berries for, for the birds. So now as we're moving into the autumn time, you can see more berries are appearing on the hedges. Um, like the blackberries out at the moment, we'll have the haws and the white thorn. Um, and they're a fab food source for, for birds during the autumn months. And we also have 35 bird species that nest in hedges. So they avail of the shelter and the cover provided by hedges. And that's another really important point to remember um, when we're talking about hedgerow management. There are mammals that use the, use the hedges to move through the landscape. So you can imagine that the hedgerows on a farm are there like highways for nature, corridors that allow the wildlife to move safely between the habitats. So an example that I like is the barn owl. He flies along the path of the hedges and other linear features like field margins. He's scanning the habitat below for his prey. And then on the ground level, you have smaller mammals seeking cover in the hedges. So the hedge is an integral part of the food chain there and it's vital for movement of nature. And as you can see from this map from one of the future farms and the green and orange lines, uh, they're all hedges and banks that are creating connections through, through the farm. And you get an indication of the extent of those using, looking at the average field size. So a smaller average field size 
would indicate that there's more hedges, more linear features, and more corridors for nature. And Aoife, then we'll say you mentioned um, the average hedgerow on the 11 future farms that you've been looking at. And there's some quite large farms, I suppose. They're still family based farms, but they're large operations at the same time. The size of the fields and how does that impact on biodiversity? And then trying to marry the two together that the farmer is happy in terms of the paddock sizes that he has, but that he's not necessarily compromising the hedgerows and the biodiversity associated with them as well. Then, how do you overcome that potentially? Yeah, so I suppose it's all about kind of farming side by side with nature and just creating space for where you can. The average field size on the 11 farms that I've worked with is um, about seven hectares um, where we'd be targeting five and below um, but the range can be huge um, in another study by Catherine Hina the range and um, average field size went from one up to 35 so like you are dealing with that, lots of different landscapes there and it's just picking out the places that you can maybe make a little bit more space for nature like it doesn't have to be the hedgerow you can look at field margins other linear features like that as well okay so just the other um values around the hedgerows it's not just about biodiversity we get other benefits for agricultural systems as well so a lot of research being done into carbon sequestration um, and there'll be more on that from the farm carbon project that's being led by the chagas environmental science soil and land use department in in johnstown um, they are also playing a role in water quality protection, blocking runoff from directly entering the water courses. Um, and then they, they play a role in animal welfare as well. They provide shelter and shade, act as windbreakers, um, and they have a role in biosecurity as well. And like I said, they're a part of the character of the Irish landscape. They're a part of our history and local heritage, um, with a lot of town lands being defined by the hedgerows. So, with that bit of background on, what, on the what and the why, I suppose the next step is really to look at how we can manage them and that's to ensure that everyone and everything that is dependent on them is looked after. So heading into the hedge cutting season, it's vital that you put a plan in place for how you intend to manage your hedges. And the best, best place to start is identifying the type of hedges that are present on the farm. So there are different types of hedges on every farm. And that's a good thing because we want to see variety. We want to see diversity across the habitats on farm. And there's a role for each type of hedge and there's a role for, um, and there's a, a way to manage each type of hedge. So I've kind of broken it down here into the untopped and topped hedges that we would talk about. So untopped hedges that would have been planted um, like any other hedge, but now they've kind of escaped management. They've basically become or they're on their way to becoming a line of trees. So they, um, they're they often thin at the base, they're no longer stock proof, and the trees are growing up tall. But you, you might notice sometimes that they're actually so thin at the base during the, during the summertime with all the foliage around it. Then you have relic hedges under that umbrella as well. And they've already grown into a single line of trees and they usually have a full tree canopy. And they're really valuable for biodiversity as well. Then we have the topped hedges. So the dense based topped hedges, they are hedges that we would see on farms that are already receiving a lot of management. They're usually cut a bit, quite, a bit tight along the top and the sides. Um, but we'll talk about how to manage all of these um, going forward. So In terms of the escaped hedges there, um, if at the, uh, yeah. are they just hedges maybe that weren't fenced and they've just become like stock have started to move in and out through them and stuff like that and that they just don't get a chance to develop? Yeah, so I suppose if they weren't fenced off and stock able to move through them, that will create the gaps. But as well as that, kind of the cutting practices around them, they mightn't have been cut and might only been breasted all along. So you're not... Um, creating density at the density. base because okay. with every cut you you create more density okay so for those escaped hedges you have kind of two options when it comes to their management so it's really a matter of deciding yourself what you want to achieve so if the aim is to create a dense based stock proof hedge then you might consider rejuvenation that would be by laying or coppicing to bring the bulk back into the base or if you're happy to let the hedge go and um, the way you might just breast the sides and fence it off and exclude the stock from it. The relic hedges then, 
they sh really should just be left alone. Rejuvenation would be way too stressful on those that you probably won't get the result you want. So no cutting for those and make sure to fence those, those, um, those type of hedges off as well. So, and they're also contributing quite strongly in terms of the flora and fauna that's in them already, even though that it's at a higher level, I suppose, really, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. And if you fence off around those, you're kind of creating um, space for nature as well, you know, like, mm. like a field margin, but with the trees included as well. Okay. Um, I have a little clip here from one of our future farms in Mead. Um, it just goes to show the benefits of, you know, managing your scaped hedges, great, because they put on a fabulous display of the white thorns and that's all providing then for the for the, um, the the bees and the birds so topped hedges then when it comes to managing these there's kind of three main points to keep in mind and um, so the first thing to do is to assess the height of the hedge so what we want is hedges that are at least 1.5 meters tall so birds nest um, in hedges well when they do so they need they need cover above and below the nest to protect them from predators in the sky and on the ground. So where the hedge is too low, the birds just won't nest. The second aspect then um, of the hedge that you should look at really is how dense it is at the base. So a dense base is important for the nesting birds again, but it also provides cover for other wildlife. And as well as that, um, you know, with a, with a dense base, you kind of have a stock proof hedge, which is a benefit to, to the farmer and to the, to the farm itself. So hedges should be cut from a, from a wide base into a kind of a triangular shape, leaving the peak at the top as high as possible and as high as the hedge cutter um, can reach. The and third said, aspect, yeah. Just before you go into the flowering piece, like, um, and I suppose I never said at the start there, while you're dealing with the Glanby monitor farms, your dad's actually a monitor farm with Jerry Gold. So um, we were on one of the monitor farms there a couple of weeks ago, a, couple, a month or two ago, and they actually don't have any hedgerows, or sorry, fence lines along some of their hedgerows. They've developed them into such dense fences because, and it's actually a question that's come in there with the trimming along and by the hedge to maintain the fence wire, um, whether that's allowed or not. But like, do you think it's realistic for people that over time that they can potentially develop the hedgerows into the same situation as the Welches have it in their farm where they they don't need to actually have a fence along them because they're so dense? The stock just don't go near them basically they graze up to the foot of them and that's it or do you still want the wire for to have that field margin potentially as well like yeah so well it's definitely achievable achieving a dense space like that it takes a bit of management it takes a lot of little and often cutting um you're trying to bulk out the hedge as you go and pull the growth and the density with you, with you while you're doing that but um yeah i definitely would be encouraging putting field margins along those hedges anyway just as another habitat for nature um, and they can be cut as well in the, in the, in the back end of the year, those field margins. Um, and they're just, they just add to the whole, to the habitats on farm as well. Um, and, and just while you're on that, then just to answer the question, I suppose, it's, as I said, it's a com very common one. I was only talking to Emer Connery about it there as well the other day. Um, outside of the cutting period, are you allowed to trim the side of the hedge to maintain the electric fence to keep it operational, I would say? Um, to keep it operational, yeah, just as long as you're not cutting the whole hedge. Um, during the hedge cutting season, if, if you're in derogation and you're in a, um, you're in a, um, if you're you're doing the rotation hedge, or you can you can press along the inside up to the level of the wire. Um, and I know that's that is a problem for a lot of farmers. But um, I suppose to try and maybe cut them back during the cutting season, and hopefully they'd they'd stay like that until you get around to it again the following year. Okay, or worst case scenario, you just literally run one run of the hedge cutter along mm -hmm. inside the wire, but you don't are not pushing it in against the hedge really, like you're just clearing off whatever debris is coming out. Yeah, so we wouldn't really be recommending doing any cutting during the when in the closed period. Yeah. And um, yeah. So the third aspect then of the top hedges um that we need to get right, I suppose, is um having them having flowering thorn trees in them so we need individual trees that will flower and um, to be left uncut and allow them to mature so that they'll produce both the flowers and the fruit to provide food for birds and bees so with the white thorn like the one here wherever you have the white thorn tree and um, you'll have white flowers around may time providing for the bees um, with the food they need and then in the autumn time you'll have those deep red haw berries and providing for the birds. So 
if you're planting a new hedge, put in a tree guard around the trees that you want to leave mature from day one. Or in mature trees, then you can um, pick out saplings that might be cropping out of the hedge. Um, so keep these three points in mind, I suppose, when you're, we want, when you're trying to avoid kind of inappropriate management to ensure that the, the bees are, the bees and the birds are kept happy. So what we want to avoid is having topped hedges that are too short. Um, we want to avoid hedges that are, that have been cut, I suppose, to the same point every year, which means that the growth have been pulled up to that point and they're gone really gappy and thin at the base. And also we want to avoid having trees or hedges that don't have any um, white thorn trees or any other type of flowering trees throughout it. And you can see so that that can happen, um, obviously, when people start going in with the hedge covers next week, like if they'll cut the hedge to the extent that the last picture there shows, there will be no flowers come on that next year, really. It, you'll be lucky if it'll green up really in early next, next year. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And like that's a big long stretch there for, you know, you need um, trees at, at kind of irregular intervals along any stretch of hedge or just, you know, for even for birds, for song ghosts and things like that. But, you know, you need them to flower and be providing the food source as well along the hedge. Okay. Um, so I suppose it's good to get maybe a farmer's take on this. So, uh, Donald Cavanagh is um, a future farm signpost farmer in the Glambia Chagas program. He is milking about 200 cows um, near Bolton Glass in Wicklow. Um, and he's uh, been involved in my ongoing studies as well. So I would have mapped his farm. Um, there's 6% biodiversity on the farming platform and almost nine kilometers of hedgerows. And that makes up about 2% of the biodiversity on the farming platform. So in this clip, he goes through his approach to hedgerow management for various types of hedges on farm and that ranges from new hedges to established hedges and some escaped hedges. I like to try and keep them high um, but also maybe a slope on them so that uh, there's good cover there. And I'm here with Donald Kavanagh who is a farmer in the Glambia Tagus Open Source Future Farm Monitor Farm Programme and we're talking all about hedges. So Don, you have about nine kilometres of hedgerow on your farm. Why are they so important? Yeah, um, for me, I suppose it's very important for for um, uh, shelter for cows uh, for one reason. And uh, the other thing then is, is, is more importantly, I suppose, uh, biodiversity is going to be big. And um, there's a good range. I know I have a good range of different types of trees, uh, different types of trees all through the hedges here. So we have um, Black thorn, white thorn, dog rose, um, brambles, um, ivy. So there's good uh, cover there for um, for birds um, for the winter and that. Um, so it's it's important for me to maintain that uh, and keep that right um, going forward. Um, so then I suppose for for cutting the hedges, um, I like to try and keep them high. Um, but also maybe a slope on them so that uh, there's good cover there um, so that you know um, that they can grow fairly high and, and, and keep that. Also selected different trees that would be nice to let them on up and give them a bit more um, cover. I planted that two years ago, a black thorn, white thorn. Um, so this year now I'm going to cut it down very low. Um, but before I do that I'm going to select um, maybe spacings, maybe every 100 metres. And, and just let some of the better trees there on up and don't cut them at all. And uh, we'll put a marker on them. So going forward then we'll have them um, in, in the hedge and uh, we'll give good, give good cover and have nice trees there as well. The contractors, I explained some of the things anyway about the, maybe every 300 metres, but I'd like the, a bit more, I'd like maybe every 100 metres. And then if one fails or whatever, you're still well covered. Um, and maybe leave two if there's two there and you can select again after if you want to, you know, two or three years down the road or whatever. But um, you need to tell him that and, and, and um, make sure he knows what you want. So um, I talked to Don yesterday, he's planning on um, taking a similar approach to the hedgerows this, this year. He's quite clear on what he wants to achieve from them. And like that, every other farmer should kind of have a plan for what way they want to manage their hedgerows. Um, right. Donald also touched on a really important point, and that's about having the conversation with your contractor. 
that conversation is critical. So farmers and contractors, they just need to be on the same page. So having a plan in mind for the management of the hedge is really important and communicating that to the contractor because they'll do what the farmer wants, but you just need to take the guessing out of it for them and having that conversation and I suppose trying to move away from maybe the perception that you need to have neat and tidy hedges and maybe that's what the contractor thinks you want. So having the conversation about how you want your hedge roads managed, explain the shape of the hedge you want to achieve, explain the height um, and where possible then make life a bit easier for them, mark the trees that you want to keep um, or just and make sure you highlight it to the farm or to the contractor that you want them, want the some mature trees left in the in the hedge. So I suppose just the main points is that whereas next from next week on you're permitted to cut your hedges. So the first of September to 28th of February. And um, it's you decide what you want the hedge to do for you and make a plan around that. And always keep biodiversity in mind and the benefits that these hedgerows are providing for us. Make your plan and then contact or contact your contractor and have a conversation with them. And I suppose if anyone wants any more information, um, there's literally a week's worth of information on the Tagus website. It was compiled by Catherine Keena and lots of other contributors last year. So there's videos and articles there on everything from the history of hedgerows and biodiversity, hedge cutting, planting and rejuvenation. And there's lots of um, information leaflets there as well. So thanks very much, that's, Stuart. That's great, Aoife. So um, just, uh, I suppose, you know, the way people are kind of being recommended as well as leaving up the, the individual trees in the hedges, but not only to cut um, maybe one every three or every three years on sections of the farm. In terms of identifying that section, would you make any comment on that for people, say, in terms of your plan that you're talking about there now? So when the contractor's coming next week or the week after, have having identified where you want him to cut, is there anything you'd recommend people be look out for be looking out for in terms of identifying the hedge that they want to do or first and foremost this year now? Um I suppose it's it's goes back to looking at the types of hedges you have on the farm. Um probably those top in space hedges they're the ones you want to target for getting your um, your mature trees to grow up out of. So have a look at those um, hedges. They're usually internal hedges or they're along kind of um, passageways. Um, so if there's a sapling growing up out of them, just to put a marker on it and let the contractor know that you want to keep that hedge or not to not to touch it with the with the flail. Okay. And um, we'll say it was an, an, in the derogation situation, you're kind of choosing either to leave them grow up or to go with the three year rotational situation. But what you're saying there actually is to do a combination of both. Yeah, so you there's you do one or sorry, and or so you can do a combination. Very good. Um, doing a biodiversity plan for the farm, could the plan be used for the next five years then if you started with that? like? Yeah, I suppose, like, especially if you're going down the rotational cutting um, side, you need to decide what hedges you're going to target each year for the coming plan. Um, where you're trying to bulk up hedges, you know, that, that plan, what you're trying to do there is little and often cutting. So that will fit into the plan for years to come. You know, you're trying to build up a hedgerow. And um, so, yeah, a biodiversity plan and a hedgerow plan is kind of a long term thing. And in terms of we'll say consulting with somebody to do that, that biodiversity plan then is there like we'll say do you think people really need to consult with someone like farmers in general have a good concept of nature in, them, in themselves but uh, in a lot of cases as you said it's just a lack of communication that their hedgerows maybe have been trimmed a bit sharper than they might have wanted them in but it's done and you can do no more about it but now people are going to be more conscious and aware of it so the opportunities there for to kind of guide that. Do you think farmers need to actually consult with people in terms of the hedgerow management or just do you think they'll know how to do it themselves? Um, well, like farmers are working in nature the whole time, but I suppose we just need to make sure that what we're doing is best practice. So like there's loads of information available online, like your advisor can point you in the right direction as well. Um, it's always good to talk to people and maybe even get, get the opinions of other farmers um, you know, in your discussion group or, or whatever, wherever you meet them. Um, but yeah, I know it's coming down the line, we have a lot more like results-based payments, things like that. And that will all contribute to educating all of us about how to manage biodiversity better. And I suppose just to highlight it, maybe I might be putting you on the spot now with this question, Aoife, but 
um, bird species and we'll say bees and, and butterflies in particular, I suppose, we've probably seen a decline in those in the last number of years. And a lot of it has to do with, as you said, their birds in particular not wishing to nest below the 1.5 metres, lack of density in the hedges affecting them as well. Will we be able to reverse the trend fairly rapidly, do you think, if we can get our act together in relation to hedgerow management? Um, I don't know how rapidly we'll be able to do it, but, you know, every little step in the right direction is going to make an improvement. Um, like a lot of our bee species, our native bee species are threatened with extinction, um, where we can provide like a food source for them. So keeping your white thorn trees, your black thorn trees or other flowering trees to mature in the hedgerow, like you're, you're already helping those bees out, you're, you're providing them with the food source that they need. Um, same with the birds, then food source, the cover, you know, small steps in the right direction, you know, um, adding different kind of new management practices to your, to your list, that'll all, you know, it's a step in the right direction. Very good. So listen, Aoife, thanks very, very much for joining me today. You stepped in at the last minute uh, because of, uh, due to the unavailability of another person that I asked and you did a fantastic job. Um, hopefully everyone will pay attention now to what you said and <laughs> deliver on the ground next week in terms of hedgerow management. Um, so thanks for coming on and the best of luck with your studies, okay? So thanks to everyone for tuning in today. Um, just to remind you again of what I told you about last week, there's a Munster Bovine um, webinar tonight that you can register for. If you just look up um, Monster Bovine on Twitter or on Facebook, you'll see the registration details there. And Dennis Howard is, is looking after it or is leading that. Uh, Tommy Heffernan is going to be the, um, the host for the, the evening and Doreen and Joe Patton are going to be involved in it as well in terms of interpreting the new lifetime reports that um, Munster brought out last year. So that's well worth tuning into. Um, and the, I suppose the other thing is we'll be back next week um, on Let's Talk Dairy. We're finalising our September schedule at the moment. So I, won't have, I don't have a topic for you for next week just yet, um, but we'll, we'll be releasing something next Monday or Tuesday, hopefully to inform people of what's coming up for the month of September. Thanks for tuning in. Um, enjoy the lovely weather. Everybody take care while we're enjoying that lovely weather and stay safe. Uh, both from a COVID point of view and farm safely also. So thanks again, Aoife. That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. And don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday, so do listen in then. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey, and thanks for listening.